Loso has a hard stop to catch a plane at 4.30, so we, we are going to be done. <laughs> no, no. We're going to be done at 4.30. Okay. So um, mostly we'd like to um, produce some interaction with the audience, so if anybody has a burning question, um, please step to the mic. Otherwise, I'll kind of start a little bit of the conversation. <clears throat> let, let me start with a, with a question to, uh, to Stuart Russell, um, kind of... Uh, you know, as it relates to your, your comments that ultimately computers will make better decisions than humans. <clears throat> and I wanted to ask you that question uh, in the context of analysis. <clears throat> so um, the, the, the task of analysis is a hard one, and human analysts perform the task of analysis. <clears throat> so um, <clears throat> in, in terms of, of these better decisions, do you do you ultimately think machines will make better decisions than human analysts would be able to make? Can you sort of comment on that, expand on that? Um, so I have to, yeah, I think so. Um, <laughs> partly um, because they, they don't suffer from either short-term or long-term memory limitations. So they literally can ingest everything the human race has ever written. Um, and then synthesize, uh, integrate that information, find connections. Um, but doing that, you know, in, one of the characteristics of analysis is that nothing is taken at face value. That you never assume that the identity of the speaker is known. Um, you know, there's always uncertainty uh, about everything. And um, so this is one of the things that parabolistic programming languages actually handle very well. Uh, and that's one of the reasons it works so well for the seismic data interpretation, because precisely the, the identity, right, you know, is this blip, uh, you know, that, that's measured, you know, on the Falkland Islands, is that coming from the same event as some other blip that's measured in Greenland? Um, that's uncertain. And what it does is it sorts out all those possibilities across the entire planet um, by essentially look, looking for the combination of assumptions that is both self-consistent and highly uh, supported by the data. So I, I think the, the big gap right now between what these systems can do and what a human analyst does is the background knowledge of, uh, of human activities, you know, of economic activities, um, and again, I just don't see how deep learning is going to do this. You know, uh, I, I work a little bit on uh, financial data analysis um, and modeling the financial behavior of individuals. So if you take a model-based approach, you can build in the fact that there's such a thing as conservation of money. So if you spend $100, you have $100 less in your bank account. Deep learning systems don't know that, right? So that means they need, you know, and for every one of those things they don't know about the world, that, that multiplies the amount of data they need by another factor of 100. Um, and so um, the dream that goes back in AI to, you know, the early 80s and Doug Lennett's psych project of developing that background knowledge, that common sense of how the world works, I think it's still unfulfilled, but it's, it, would be, it would have to be solved uh, in order to build something that was a hu superhuman analyst. Uh, in the meantime, could you, could you find ways of combining some of the capabilities of the machines, which are superior in, in sifting through hypotheses and finding ones that are consistent, detecting inconsistencies and so on, with human understanding of background knowledge? Um, that, that's an interesting question. So at some point, it's the, the case that humans would have sort of insight that machines wouldn't, but ultimately you see that crossing over. I, I think that's what you're, you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, Rao, did you want to weigh in? Yeah. So I, I guess um, there are two issues. One is, at least in the beginning, they may well, sometimes somebody might actually do a better decision than the human analyst. The real question is, can they sort of convince the human analyst that they have actually made a better decision. And we can't, until we come to a point where there is like 100% certainty that the machines are having, have all the knowledge and are actually coming to the right analysis conclusion, we will always need to be in the loop and we need to be convinced. And that's actually a technically challenging problem as I was pointing out, you know, convincing a human 
uh, in the loop is not a soliloquy. It's not machine talking to itself, saying, yeah, it just makes sense because I did this, I did this, I did this, because humans hopefully have lives and they don't want to know what the actual step-by-step -step reasoning of the machine is, but you know, getting a, a compelling explanation. That's one aspect. And the second is, while I completely agree that there are, you know, we may not get 100% certainty with the explicability explanation sort of things, um, there may be a possibility of triaging the system. So I think some, we were talking to somebody, I was talking to somebody earlier that um, you could actually use analysts even with lower experience, lower level of experience, to sort of see whether the machine is making completely stupid errors. And in fact, the interesting thing is because of there is no shared background common sense knowledge that you have. These are all essentially narrow um, savants. And so they could make truly horrific you know, errors, which people can spot even without having humongous background in analysis of that area. So it might actually open a scenario where you'd have less experienced analysts working with these machines. But for that to happen, the machine should be able to kind of provide a proper interpretable reason as to why it came to its conclusion. So, it, uh, Rob, do you want to? Well, I just wanted to. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, okay. So I just wanted to re respond a little bit to what Stuart was saying um, there about the analyst and uh, particularly was saying that some of the capabilities would just be very difficult for deep learning to do. So I think, um, you know, I certainly do agree with, you know, what some of the previous speakers were saying, that you know, purely you know, if you have explicit knowledge, you should try and use that rather than trying to, you know, create a whole bunch of examples and then get the deep learning system to, to learn it. But the difficulty is in, off, in certain many situations, and I think the analyst example is a good one, the information is just not provided to you in sort of nice, explicit kind of, you know, formal rules. Um, you know, for example, you know, it's true that the machines have the potential to ingest information from all over the, you know, the web and so on and so forth, but it's in, it's in an unstructured format. Right, and so converting that to sort of some sort of logical representation that you can then reason with, in and of itself, is just an enormous endeavor and completely impractical at sort of internet scale. And the site project, which Stuart referred to, I mean, the, that project actually, I think most people regard, perhaps I'm just biased because I'm in the deep learning part of the world uh, community, but they regard that as a big failure. I mean, that was an attempt to sort of build this very structured knowledge representation and so hopefully there'd be some sort of emergent property from it. But it just, it just never happened. And so I think, you know, the sort of deep learning crowd are sort of betting on the fact that you can actually try and reason without, you know, perhaps having huge amounts of uh, structured knowledge available to you. Okay, so, and so that, of course, it means that, um, I mean, there are tenant problems, of course, which means you, you now no longer have the ability to so, so clearly delineate the reason, the path by which you reach your conclusions and so on. But it does give you the ability to, you know, properly ingest, to, you know, you can scalably ingest huge amounts of information with it. Um, you know, from real-world sources, not from sort of idealized, um, you know, knowledge bases, which um, you would have to use if you didn't use uh, the deep learning methods. So, yeah. Manuel? Uh, I just think that these, these uh, concepts of decision-making is uh, quite um, complex because in some sense a data analyst, a human making decisions, is never a one-shot kind of decision. You kind of gain uh, confidence that people make good decisions over time. So you make a decision today, then it proves to be right, you get some reward, you build trust in this decision making, and eventually people can explain why, and it's kind of a relationship that has a, a nature of temporal nature. I mean, it's not exactly something that immediately we are proven to have made the right decision or the wrong decision, except uh, in maybe some, a few cases. And another thing that is actually fundamental for us to understand, and I can't wait that an AI system helps me do, make good, uh, helps me support or recommend decisions, is that if you think about the AlphaGo program, one of the things that it did remarkably was what we call in, a, from a technical point of view, to explore the space of things that could be done beyond what was being taught as the ones that would make sense. So machines, AI systems, will have this amazing ability of following the data for sure, but eventually also trying, maybe in simulation hopefully, things that are of great kind of like deviance from what has been done before. And that's how in some sense AlphaGo ended up like beating the humans because it didn't play 
things that the humans were expected to play. I was talking with Demis Asabis recently, and he was explaining how in some game, that uh, the third game, the second game, this human who was playing with the machine, Lisa Dole, saw kind of a move of the machine, of AlphaGo, and was <gasps> puzzled. How in the world did these machine played this and it took off went like for 15 minutes to think about how to respond to that because it was so unusual that type of like move so i think that which ended up winning the game so maybe one day if we think about these decisions or trying to uh, cure cancer or do something that is extremely hard for humans. Maybe we have to let the, machi the machine try, in some sense, to explore this space of things that are not even conceivable by us, but eventually may lead into solutions that were not in the path of our reasoning, but end up at achieving the objectives that we wanted. So I see a great potential for AI to enable us to explore a space that we kind of maybe don't have the ability to explore. And of course, it cannot be uh, on the real world. And there are researchers, colleagues of mine, that work on the safe exploration problem. But it has a very beautiful concept from the point of view of decision making, because maybe it will lead us to find completely new avenues of solutions to our problems. So I'll pause to see if, any, if there are any follow-up questions. Yeah, go ahead. So just to follow up to that one, um, as machines you know, explore state spaces where humans may never go and come up with solutions that humans may never discover, how do we as humans, particularly, say, in, in militaries, um, test and validate these systems to operate as we would in, in a hopefully safe manner for, you know, for humanity? Yeah, I think it's a challenge. It's a challenge, but on the other hand, you know, one of the things that Demis was telling me also, Demis Asabis, was that the moment AlphaGo warned to Lisa Dole, Lisa Dole was fascinated by what he had missed. And he became like a, uh, he, he became a learner now of how in the world this, did the machine come up with this? And open like all this mind of Lisa Dole I, and Demis was telling me, AlphaGo was stopped, didn't care at all whether it won or it lost. <laughs> and Lisa Dole was fascinated by even like rediscovering the game by seeing what this machine eventually showed. So I don't know exactly to tell you, frankly, from a, a, a risky point of view. This was a game. This is like things that people do. If, I mean, it, but on the other hand, it has an implication potentially in your kind of life, I mean, in worlds of great risk that maybe we'll find methods to solve the problem without hurting so much somewhere else. Maybe we, there is this concept that, I mean, for, so just to wrap this up, there is this concept eventually that there is kind of like the perfect solution somewhere, and we are like applying gradients to our solutions and improve them slightly where the, really the solution is miles away in another hill and maybe if someone just jumps us there, then we can as humans do the gradient and polish. But in some sense, the machine may help us, may help us jump to the other place that, to this other place that we did conceive. And we could always not jump there. I mean, we, it's our choice. But I think that uh, Demis, made me understand that the great hero was Lisa Dole, who, after all, was now are fascinated by learning more. And that's really how I see that humans and machines may interact. Humans may actually ask these questions to the machines. The machines may come up with this solution, something that fascinates us, that was outside of our scope of the reasoning. And then magically, we know more. And then we start working on that, and then we challenge the machine with more things. Then magically, the machine puts us somewhere else. And in some sense, we are in this kind of like using the computers for our benefit. And we drive these questions, and the machines end up like making us think about phenomenal things that maybe we didn't think about them before and using different, ma but uh, concretely, I don't know. But I just know that these machines will be able to do this type of interaction with humans. So, so I think it's, it's a, the, the point that you make is how does one explain, how does the machine explain when, in fact, the human doesn't see uh, that 
There, that's a very important point. In fact, oftentimes we are talking about explanations when the machines are making stupid errors and the humans have to catch them. But the real hope for AI technology is that they will find things that we actually didn't see. And there are two aspects to it. One is in computer science, we understand that generation is harder than verification. So things that we may not generate, if somebody else points out to is oftentimes we might be able to see it. Sometimes. Okay, that's one aspect. The second is, of course, we are actually reasonable learners. So if it's, you know, in the case of Liz at all, actually, I think in the entire Go community, as I understood, spent a bunch of time figuring out exactly why did this work. And then they have sort of newer technologies and that sort of thing that could happen. In the, in the end, essentially, the I mean, I kind of remember this uh, Jack Nicholson character in, I guess, A Few Good Men, that you know, sometimes you can have this, you can't handle the truth. You can't have the truth because you can't handle it. So I hope that won't come to that in the sense when the machine does say something, uh, rather than just assume, you know, if, you know, we be, that it's wrong, we may be able to actually either verify it or, you know, spend time offline. And once you sort of learn that it was right, it increases your trust. Next time around, you might require less or fewer explanations. Yeah, I just briefly wanted to add. So AlphaGo knows the rules of Go, and they're actually, they are wired in by the human. It doesn't learn them. Um, and so it has a correct model of the domain. So if, if it says this move, uh, you know, moving on the, on the fourth rank instead of the third rank is better, um, you know, its explanation is, well, because I ran 700 billion simulated games and I win more often, right, which, is, which is not much help. Um, so the human has to sort of pick apart the underlying reasons. Yeah. But of course, if you don't have uh, a model of the domain, there's no way yeah. it can, it can you know, invent, uh, you know, a new, you know, a, a new plan uh, for subverting the North Korean government uh, because it, it doesn't have a model of governments and, and humans and, and weapons and and subversion, and it's it's completely meaningless. Um, and so I do I do think that um, in some areas, for example, tax avoidance is an area where we can write out the rules. We can write out the uh, you know the rules of financial transfers and transactions and taxation, uh, and we can actually invent new forms of tax avoidance. Right? We can say this this set of laws has the following loopholes, right? And then we can fix the laws uh, to prevent those loopholes. Uh, but that's a rel that's a domain which is relatively precise and can be written down formally. I think in the areas that intelligence analysts deal with, it's it's much more difficult uh, to write down the rules of the game and then find you know without that the process of finding unsuspected solutions to the rules uh, can't even begin. Okay, uh, let me explore another topic a little bit. So, Rao, um, it, towards the maybe the back third of your presentation, you kind of skip through a slide where I think you're going to talk about video spoofing, mm -hmm. where I assume that basically these machines can study YouTube videos and after doing so can produce a video um, that is essentially imperceptibly different uh, yeah. from somebody speaking something that they didn't speak. Yes, uh, can you explain so, on that? So I guess the identity spoofing is something that is actually quite easy, quite, you know, at the possible level of technology right now. There are great examples, some of which I was just showing there. I think they had, for example, Obama say something that he didn't actually say in that particular speech, by, and, and you can't tell because the lip movements are exactly the right ones. And then they also had, in, in another example, they had actually, I think, you know, the, uh, an actor would be essentially making gestures and uh, Trump would actually be making those gestures in a recorded video. So this is kind of very interesting advent of our great strides in, you know, perceptual intelligence. Uh, there was this funny, we spent a bunch of time in that workshop that I mentioned at, uh, in March at, uh, at ASU on, uh, on, you know, uh, attack surfaces and AI. And, you know, one of the cute things that came up was, I don't know how many of you remember, but um, there was this story that Charlie Chaplin took part in a Charlie Chaplin lookalike contest and came in second. And there is this possibility that in future we'll all be Charlie Chaplins. We'll all be poor imitations of ourselves. Somebody else actually can spoof us. The real question is you almost need like an anti-Turing test. You need to sort of figure out how to differentiate um, you know, between you know the the, the machines, the, the the imagined reality versus real reality, and it can become quite hard. So these are at, in attack surfaces that are actually becoming easy. So if you have 
uh, I mean, you know, somebody call you, you know, with your mother's voice and say, I, you know, knowing at least some background on your history and say, you know, I need the following such and such help. It's, you know, it's going to be pretty hard for you not to actually, you know, deal with that issue. And then that's sort of an additional angle on the cyber crime that's just being opened up because we can do voice spoofing and video spoofing. Um, I just want to, to add a small thing, and I, and I really think that uh, the the amount of attacks and the, um, the, the the what we can do with our technology seems to be unbounded, unbounded. Uh, we we really uh, can do millions of things, and I believe that these examples that we know that even like for example in my cobot, who knows when they put the coffee on the basket? That's not the bomb that is going to be delivered to the lab. I mean, I don't have a bomb detector on the on the actual <laughs> on the actual basket. So it's clear that I mean we are creating this AI technology extremely powerful. So. I also think that it's clear that this technology did not, did not come from the sky. It was invented by humans, human minds. It's in the clear path of computing when it started in the early 50s or maybe 40s. So this is not the path that suddenly we, they became, uh, it's, it's just, it's normal. What I believe it happens, I mean, when we talk about these things, that this is a kind of a call to humankind. It is a call to us. I mean, do we want to make good uses or bad uses? I mean, if someone invents a way that this video is telling something, and now what I say, Rao is going to say, the, the same words and its identity and these, all of these, well, then what? I mean, we can try to have mechanisms to try to filter these things and try to find them out, but you know, the human mind will be even better at whatever. So. What I'm trying to say is that the, our only chance, and I mean, I keep saying these, maybe it's because I'm becoming older. I keep saying these is that the only effort we should put on is in fact on letting our, on educating people, nothing else. I mean, it's the, people are going to be the inventors of the use of the technology. Let the technology advance with its like, a, a str I mean, with what we need to still develop, the combining the reasoning, the perception, the learning, to try to actually, how do you say, manage these humongous amounts of data that we became now master producers of data, Fitbits and cell phones and uh, uh, Nests and Alexes. I mean, what in the world are we inventing? We are inventing millions of things that unless AI processes this data, who is going to look at all the videos that are taking in a city, if not an AI system? Who is going to, f to process all the data we are collecting, our, our transactions and so forth? So it's kind of like we are on one side producing all these enormous amount of data. We are on the other side thinking, oh, way I can be that bad, but who is going to handle what we are producing? So the best way for us to think about, be it in the military, be it in government, be it in our homes, is to really have people invent good uses of this technology. It's not, we cannot do anything. The technology is extremely powerful. So it's investing on people, education, people, that's it. <laughs> investing on people. I just wanted to add one more, yeah, just one more thing. Um, that, I mean, so I tend to be less sanguine about people's good intentions than my friend Manuela. I think they, we will find adversarial uses, but I think the big plus point is that AI can be part of the solution. You know, I mean, when you open it, attack surfaces, it's not that only the bad guys have AI, the good guys have AI too. So in fact, if in fact your mother does call, at some point of time, we shouldn't be reading our emails. We shouldn't be taking our phone calls. There should be personal AI which screens. So your personal AI will call my personal AI and try to spoof it. And if I have the best version, then it will then let the call through. So my, my point is, I think we cannot assume that technologies won't be misused because, come on, that's yeah. exactly what we do. I mean, you know, as a humankind. And, uh, and I think, uh, humankind, <laughs> not me. But I think we have to, f but it is indeed possible that it opens up more interesting research problems, which is, you know, how do you uh, use AI as a solution to the adversarial things that were made possible by AI? You know, that's very much, um, you know, what we're doing. So that's one of the things that, that I just, just want to mention. I just want to make a, a very brief point. 
yes, there are people who do bad things, but the, there are many other spheres where people do bad things, and we have laws uh, to make those things illegal. Uh, in these new areas, there are not laws, so it's completely legal to produce a voice synthesizer yeah. that appears to be your mother asking yeah. you to do something. It's completely legal to make a video of anyone doing anything, right? right? Now, just a simple rule saying, you know, even if you want to allow that, at least say, if this is synthesized and not real, it should say so, yeah. right? It should say, you know, just like for political ads, you have to say, you know, who paid for this ad, right? That's a rule, even yeah. though it's politics, which is very little regulated. Uh, right. If you make a fake video of an actual person doing something that wasn't real, then it yes. has to say so. Yes. Mm. Right. That's, that seems like a bare minimum that we could do, but at the moment, yes. nothing. Everything is, it's a free for all, it's a wild west. Yes. So just to say that, uh, that making completely believable fake videos at the moment is probably, you know, it's automatically without any, it's still a couple years away, but it's certainly, you know, very mm. much on the horizon. Yeah. And then, I mean, and then there'll be this, you can make, what we're talking about essentially is this arms race now, if you were, didn't have legislation between your AI. I mean, as soon as you, there's some AI technology for blocking, for detecting the, the fake video, then uh, you, you could also then train the method that generated it to circumvent it as well. So. Okay. okay, that that generated some questions. Um, right here, go ahead. Uh, I, I guess one of the... Uh, pardon me, pardon me. This is webcasted, so wait okay. for a is microphone. There, is, there a portable, is there a portable mic? Yeah, yeah there, there is. Thanks. Uh, several of the speakers have talked about uh, you know transparency and you know trying to get the uh, the AI to <clears throat> you know basically do the right thing and stuff like that. So as a uh, kind of a expanded thought experiment, I just want to kind of uh, talk about deception because I you know I kind of view as a longtime AI guy, you know deception is one of those human behaviors, and to, to me actually this was what 25 plus years ago. Uh, at Georgia Tech, they, they basically did the squirrel experiment. And I assume most of the people are familiar with that. But basically, for those who aren't, you know, squirrels hide nuts. So they have to make it through the winter, so they hide their little nuts at different places. So what they did was they modeled the behavior. So you have one AI who's the squirrel who's burying his nuts. The other AI is trying to find those nuts. And so the squirrel who's burying his nuts basically starts to deceive and goes to locations and things where he doesn't have nuts to basically fool the other squirrel where he may be hiding the nuts. And so what I thought was kind of interesting to take up the next level is that really what you're starting to see here is that the AI is not only looking at the deception part, but also looking at how you would view that deception. So I want to talk about that. Um, well, so we see this in poker, right? So, you know, how you, there's bluff and double bluff, and so the game, game theoretic solutions for games of partial information automatically produce that, that type of behavior. So they would do what the squirrels were doing. Um, you know, but obviously if the squirrel spends all his time going to places where he doesn't have nuts, he's gonna starve to death. So, right. you know, he's gotta figure out what's the right, the right, what's the right balance. And, and you see the same thing, um, so I looked a little bit at this, um, uh, reputation falsification, for example, in eBay, where you, you create thousands of fake logins. It's called a Sybil attack. Mm -hmm. you, you create thousands of fake logins, and they do transactions with each other um, to raise their reputation as being honest, and then, they, then they'll start transacting with real people and rip them off uh, until their reputation disappears, and then you make another thousand logins. Um, and with the right detection capabilities, you can, you can see these patterns of behavior um, and snuff them out. So then, you know, the solution ends up being that, yeah, they can still do it, but only at a very low level. If they try and do it too much, they're going to be detectable. So they can't look too different from an ordinary person, and an ordinary person is fine, right? So it, it's, a very, it's a very complicated game, um, but AI systems, I think, you know, have no problem creating 18 levels of deception. All right, so they, they could watch the Inception movie and they would understand, <laughs> they would understand what the hell was going on, <laughs> right? You, you know, so, um, so I think you could, get, um, you, you could get AI systems to concoct schemes that could be extremely difficult for, for people to understand and, and detect. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, so I, I think, again, um, um, to me, deception is a higher level of intelligence, honestly. I mean, I think there are actual you know, studies showing that the kids only learn to lie after they figure out that their mental models are different from other people's mental models. So it actually cognitively higher up. Um, and, you know, and I think, uh, so again, the ability to track what you are writing in the other person's mind and what their current status is, is extremely important. And that is, you know, if I can cooperate with you, cooperate with you, I can also deceive you. And the second thing is, in, in that workshop that I was talking about earlier, we talked about this fact that sometimes you might actually use sort of white lies to get people to do right things. You know, for example, we all know what is healthy living, healthy eating, but we don't do it anyway. And so the question is, if there is a way in which people can essentially, you know, do some white lies and deceive you into doing the right thing. Now, of course, you could say, well, you're opening a huge Pandora's box, but the reality is we are being deceived anyway in, in other ways. So it's a deception is not always just a bad thing, and, and, and it requires, it, it's a very interesting extra capability you get when you are able to handle the mental models of the others, which is an important thing. And, uh, and I think, again, in fact, I mean, unlike what uh, you know, Stuart is saying, currently it's not very clear to me that AI systems that we currently have have the ability to model other people's mental states. So when you get there, which I believe we will by you know, doing research, then they will essentially do this deception. So when I go to these trust in autonomy workshops that military runs, so I'm actually sitting sometimes and thinking, do you guys realize that you are opening up yourself for a second order, you know, end of the world, where essentially, I mean, the best Hollywood movies like Sting are, the entire movie is to kind of get you, get you to get to a particular mental model in the last minute deceive you. And so you could have, you know, machines which can do that too. They can essentially engender long-term trust in you only to change it. And of course, they don't have to be evil machines. They could be just controlled by somebody smart who is just, you know, making this machine do that. So those are our issues. Um, I think the gentleman, did you have a question? Go ahead. So you talked a little bit earlier about um, our inability to understand the failure mode of certain of these algorithms. And I want to take it up a level and think about the failure mode of the system of systems. We know that complex systems fail chaotically, high frequency stock market trading, um, uh, uh, energy, uh, uh, electrical power grid, and so on. Is there research, or are you involved in any research, looking at the failure mode of these systems of systems and our ability to detect and perhaps prevent or perhaps create chaotic failure in these systems? So, I mean, I was only personally, I was, in, in my own talk, I was just talking about the fact that perceptual systems have individual systems of failure modes that we can't uh, particularly analyze. The fact that general complex automation systems can have failures that will take a long time to analyze. I mean, so for example, the flash crash on the, on the Wall Street, that's not, don't put it on AI, and at least as far as I can tell. And it still took a long, long time for people to understand exactly what crazy interaction between 18,000 pretty non-intelligent systems led to this particular flash crash. And so I think people may very well be working on these sorts of things, but I think within AI we are focusing, I mean, the, the specific part I was mentioning is, even for a single system, when it makes an error, you just can't see why it made an error. This is something different from what we are used to. Sometimes, as I said in that other, uh, the Norwegian bus example, when, you, when I say I see burqa-clad women, you can almost see why I saw it. And that's a big issue because internal representations are not at all aligned, and that's going to be an interesting issue. So the, the, the great conference in deep learning is called International Conference on Learning Representations. You know, if you had that name of that conference, like even seven, eight years back, people would have thought that means representations that people might have something to do with, such as the logic and probabilistic logic and so on and so forth. Right now it is, the machines learn their representations, you don't have to be part of it, and of course you also don't get to be part of the dialogue with them. So that does open up interesting new challenges. 
So uh, one, one thing along these lines that uh, we have been working on, uh, if you ask about research and people have been working on, is this detection of anomalies. So basically people try to look at the, the, the way that the system is functioning and, and at least alert that the actual statistical performance of the system is diverging from the, act, from the usual uh, performance. And so that's why we detect anomalies actually in cobot or in the robots that were not predefined. For example, if a motor starts failing, we did not have a condition to detect that, but somehow the behavior of the system starts diverging from the residual behavior, and you can alert that something is not according to normal. So somehow we cannot explain why that divergence comes up, but again, the human plays that role of interpreting what is this failure all about, or the, the machine also can provide uh, support, maybe like more scriptic about that anomaly, but that's how we interpret a lot of failure. So there are many of these kind of filters for failure detection on these robots. Of course, they are all kind of based on normal execution, and you assume that you have the concept of normal of execution. But for example, if you unplug the camera, so the robot starts seeing many, in some sense, completely black images in its input to the reasoner, and that never happens. Sometimes it, uh, it so you have this detection that there is something anomalous, and of course, if it's really just a black building, which didn't happen to be part of the normal perception, it's going to detect an anomaly, and it was not. But so there is this concept of normal versus abnormal, and we can identify those as deviations from normal, and a lot of research is on that anomaly detection. And then, of course, the explanation part and why this is anomalous is all with respect to some normal behavior and why, and so it's always about this differential, this deviation from normal. And uh, that's uh, the research we do in this type of like uh, detection of failure. A question for uh, Stuart, uh, following the variance in common that you made towards the very end. Uh, that there's way too, and I'm just paraphrasing here, there's way too much uh, deep learning being done. Now, that's really, of course, credit to the University of Toronto and their spin off. This is the old Marvin Minsky versus Toronto. And uh, without knocking the University of Toronto system, they did a wonderful job, of course. But there's a lot more to artificial intelligence, as you point out, in machine learning than deep learning. So, what is your assessment based on that? Where in other words, another way of, asking it, way of asking is, how much attention should I pay to the non-deep learning part of AI? As you probably know, there is some commercial start, 90 plus percent of the commercial startups are in deep learning. But there are a few, Gamelon, which is an MIT spin-off, that's looking at Bayesian approaches. So where's the, now I, I get a lot of information from my commercial folks, so they tell me one story, but from your perspective, where is, this, where is that going, if anywhere? Well, so I, um, I I say this for a number of reasons. Um, one, of course, is that I'm not a deep learning researcher, so it pisses me off. <laughs> so you have to discount that part. Um, but uh, I, I run into a lot of CEOs of large corporations who have needs for AI that deep learning is not even in the business of being able to meet. Um, and part of what happens is that if a problem is just completely not amenable to deep learning. You know, for example, you know, I have a factory and I want to uh, schedule manufacturing for the next six months, which is you know, 200 million operations and personnel assignments and movements. You know, deep learning is not even that business. So what tends to happen is that the problem is defined out of existence, right? It, it's not a, it doesn't exist for the deep learning community because it's not something they can address. Um, and, uh, and that's really dangerous. Um, another, another symptom, for example, so Francois Cholet, who, who just wrote a, a pretty well-received deep learning textbook, um, he, he has a blog about the future of deep learning. So he talks about all the, the failure modes of deep learning and, and the walls that it's running up against. Um, and then he talks about what, you know, what might happen in the future to, to get around this. And, uh, it's distressing that um, 
he seems to be unaware that, you know, so he talks about the need for, you know, representation and reasoning about objects, but he seems to be unaware that anyone has ever thought those thoughts before and that there's two and a half thousand years of literature on that, <laughs> on that problem. Uh, you know, and, and, and he talks about the fact that we might, we might have, um, you know, generative models with the expressive power of Turing machines. Well, that's exactly what probabilistic programming languages are, and that technology is 20 years old. Um, and so he's, he's talking about a, a, a distant future for deep learning where they, they've made it to 1997. Uh, and that's that's kind of worrying, um, and uh, I, I see this over and over again. The younger generation uh, thinks that all there is to AI is chain rule, and you know that's it, right? There's nothing. There's nothing else. And then there's you know diddling, diddling around with layers, graduate student descent, um, and there's no way that that approach by itself. I mean, it's an incredibly useful uh, part of our toolkit, but by itself, it cannot get us anywhere close to human-level AI. Um, you, need the, you need the ability to have, you know, knowledge is an important concept that's absent from the entire deep learning literature. Um, so uh, we still need those capabilities, and I think the deep learning community can learn the hard way, or they could read something uh, and learn the easy way. I, I, I anticipate a couple of responses here, so. <laughs> <laughs> Rao, and then I'm, I'm guessing Rob. Yeah. Go so, ahead, so, Rao. So I, I think partly what um, you know, we were trying to do, some of us I think, in my talk too, is that it's an extremely useful tool, deep learning, and if you're talking to companies, asking them to work on you know, technologies that might be useful potentially much later is not going to fly. But I think we are in a crowd here. We are also talking about longer term investments. It's important to remember that neural networks were given up for dead twice, at least. Okay. It's also important to remember that essentially the people who supported neural network research were a Canadian CIFAR organization. I mean, the U.S. has large amounts of funding agencies, but there can be sometimes collective group think. And it's very important to sort of trade off exploration and exploitation. You know, I think we, you know, the, it's great to use the deep learning for what it's good for, but it also to realize that there's a lot more to intelligent behavior than just being able to do immediate perception. So it's important to see what it can and cannot do. And that's what I was hoping, you know, we will get across. So it's like, you know, where is the, I mean, as, as Wayne Gretzky, famous quote of don't go where the puck is, but where the puck is going to be. And it's not clear to me that either Stuart or I or Manuel or, you know, Rob knows where the puck is going to be. But it's if we knew, you know, how to predict future well, then we would have been actually doing deep learning work long before. Uh, and it shouldn't have taken that long to come by false starts. So why do we think that we have suddenly become smarter now and this is the only thing that will work? And, and so funding agencies in particular and policy agencies should be taking a longer view and then diversify um, their investments. And I think that's very important. And it's very important for AI researchers, of course, to be, you know, not to reinvent wheel every evening. That just makes no sense. Rob, Emmanuel. Yeah. Okay, so, um, good way my thing. All right, so I guess um, just to, you know, just, just Russell, some of the points Russell made. So I think um, if you have problems where there is a formal definition of the, of the task, then of course you should use all that, yes. that formal definition. Okay, I don't think anybody in deep would ever say, say you shouldn't. Okay, now the catch is that there are so many problems out there in the world which just, you can't easily sit down and write these things out. Now, so I gave some examples in my talk of like recognizing, you know, image, objects and images, right? So it's just very hard to write down a formal definition of what a cat looks like, okay? So people did try. I mean, they tried, okay, maybe we can fit a cylinder for its body and, you know, a little sphere for its head and so on. This was a valid approach in the 1980s and it just, it just falls apart. These things are just too brittle. So this is why the deep learning thing has proven very successful when you don't have a precise definition. Okay, now the catch is, if you want to create a truly intelligent thing, do you think, you know, for example, it's possible to, to write down a set of formal rules that govern hu human behavior? Okay, so I would argue actually it's going to be pretty difficult to do that. Okay, and that, so that leaves you with, you know, two options. So one is you could try and do the whole thing end to end with deep learning, right? So you could try and, and that's, there are some sort of deep learning, you know, 
pure, true believers who will believe that you'll be able to just hammer the whole thing with some giant neural net and, and you know, train on all the, all, this, all the interactions and human observations on YouTube and Facebook and so on, and you'll be done. The sort of more compromised solution, which I think most people would come to, is that, you, you know, you should try and learn, use, use the deep learning to sort of capture representations, which you then subsequently can, um, you know, use in some sort of more uh, structured reasoning system. Okay, so that's a sort of hybrid between the two, the two schools. Um, so I think, you know, it depends exactly who you very much talk to as to where you'll be between the sort of end-to-end. -end. The deep learning community, you know, people will be somewhere between those two uh, things I described. I mean, some people will be pure on the deep learning end of things. But. Just to, uh, uh, I completely agree with, uh, with Rob in the sense, and I agree with Stuart and Rawat. I've been doing symbolic reasoning and planning forever. But I have to tell one thing that I find fascinating, the difference between the past and these days is the data thing. In the old days, we used to think that AI would rely on knowledge that we would acquire from people or from models. We would write by hand. We would ask, how did you make the diagnosis that this person has some disease? And the doctors would provide that knowledge, and the architects would provide the knowledge how they designed these. And everything was about extracting from the human minds this knowledge that then became our logic. And yes, I pick up the block if the block is uh, uh, clear, and all sorts of like knowledge that came from a lot of like people spelling out what they knew. I think that currently we are leaving a signature, a footprint of everything we do through this data. Every, so somehow it's, it's a very interesting concept that we are revealing everything, the pictures we take, in the, in the GPS we go, routes are revealed, everything. So it's a big difference uh, for AI to really Ignore, we cannot just ignore these data. And deep learning, in some sense, is of a, of a extremely appealing and powerful, like Rob is saying, to really look at data. Maybe we know models, maybe we can use them. But magically now, we have how we use, and when we do laundry at home, our meters capture. The whole thing is data that now becomes available when we can magically learn and predict at what time is she going to do her laundry tomorrow. So what I'm trying to say is like this. We cannot avoid thinking that the challenge and the opportunity and somehow the excitement involves data. It probably also will uh, we'll have to be merged with models and other knowledge of people. Even AlphaGo used some tree search algorithm. It was not just data. But the fact is that we are in the infancy also of knowing how to process data effectively. We are, because we have all this data, and we have to actually look at cameras in the city of New York or in the city of Pittsburgh or in the city of whatever and figure out what's happening from those images. And we don't really can sit down and write the logic for, yes, the car is going to 10% of the cars turn left, 90% turn right. No, the data tells it a lot. So I actually believe that a lot of what we do now it has to do with data. Even like I, it has to do with data and the ability to process data may be driven by, I mean, we may put knowledge on top of it, but it's fascinating to think that data will reveal so many things that we may not have known before. And yes, the models will come, and yes, eventually everything will be about, but what these initial, these startup companies, these new companies need to know is that we actually have to become extremely proficient at processing data with biases, with underlying models or not, I don't know, but what matters is that this data is available and we cannot afford to disregard the data and deep learning as giving great tools for processing this data. We are there, but don't forget that every single thing we buy new, be it our cell phone, be it our thing, be it anything, is producing more data. It's everything that we have is about data. And I think that we have to embrace that as the AI challenge now also, which is process that data. So. Yep, I like models, I like logic, I like probabilistic uh, programming languages, everything. But yes, there is data. And we do need to be very, very smart about developing techniques that processes that data.
Whether so, that solves the whole problem, I don't know, but we can just not ignore that we cannot ignore that the data is there, which has embedded a lot of knowledge because as opposed to data in the past that could be capturing what are the images on satellites, this data is capturing how humans function. It's my GPS that's there. It's the pictures I take. It's at what time I take breakfast. It's the things I buy in the supermarket. It's revealing humans, how humans function, not just how the satellites or the planets move in space. It's not. It's our life, the, the, the doctors, the health, the, the tests I have, my Fitbits. It's our life that is being digitalized. It's the human life. It's the human processes, not just something else. So that's what I think it's exciting, and we cannot deny it, and yeah, so, I think so that's very exciting. Can I just exciting. say something? I'm um, yeah, so I, I, I think it's, it's, it's not, it wouldn't be accurate to say that the, the model-based AI community denies the existence of data. Um, of course, right, you know, machine learning, machine learning predates uh, deep learning by many decades, and lots of work has gone into learning model-based representations you know, the, um, that goes without saying. But learning into what, right? This is the fundamental scientific question, right? Sure, there's data, but what is, what is it that you extract from data? And one of the clear things about the world we live in is that there are things in it. Things, chairs, people, right? And relationships and events. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, deep learning is just circuits. So in circuits, there is no representation of things and relations. Uh, it, has to be, it has to be supervened on top of that. Um, and so uh, to me, it doesn't make sense to expect the deep learning system to, in to discover that the world has things in it, to invent the notion of relational representations and. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then uh, logical or probabilistic inference on top of that. We know these things. We know the world has things in it. Why don't we take advantage of that in our formal representations and our learning algorithms? Do you want, one, do you want the last word? <laughs> so, I mean, um, I mean, but, uh, so there are, I mean, there are systems that run, you know, in real practical problems which do take, you know, which do model using deep learning methods, relationships between objects, you know, they have quite heterogeneous collections of things and so on and so forth. So for example, as I, this is a project of Facebook, which, you know, Jan has talked about, which is where, you know, every single different object in Facebook, image, post, you know, um, people, everything are just represented um, as a high dimensional vector in some space. So in other words, the sort of the deep learning part is taking that thing in the real world, turning it into just a high dimensional vector. Okay, and then in that space, you can do all kinds of reasoning tasks you want to do about, you know, who's friends with somebody, who might like something, and things like that. And so, you know, that's, it's not, it's somewhere between, a, a, you know, a completely abstract, you know, uninterpreted representation and a sort of purely formal, you know, um, logical representation of that, that individual or that entity. Okay, so it's soft, it's continuous, it's just a bunch of numbers. But if you take, you know, nearby vectors in that space, that means they're probably the same thing, or, they might, or if you have, re, you know, relational operators that apply to the, you know, pairs of objects, they can tell you whether, you know, some relationship between them is, you know, is, is this, you know, it's not a physical scenario, but you can imagine other versions of this would be like these two objects, you know, relate related to one another, or they some, somehow physically connected, or you know, uh, to one another and things like that. So it is possible to do a kind of reasoning tasks, I think, a kind of reasoning tasks, I think, and to sort of instantiate yeah. real ob things in the world using deep learning in a way that you can actually achieve, you know, do real things with them. And so these, these things are actually used all the time for, like, you know, finding fraudulent activity, you know, making all kinds of predictions and stuff like that. So these are, yeah, these are real systems. Rao, did you want the final 30 seconds? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I guess I can say something non-controversial. Um, I think we are not actually arguing against um, uh, any subjects here. I think it's this there are two different things we talked about. One is data versus knowledge. Whatever is available, you want to use it. 
okay it's silly to say give me data when i want to give you knowledge it's also silly to say convert your data into knowledge and give it to me the ai technology should be able to use both of them and that's the point that i was trying to make the other question of course is which technologies are likely to be able to be better at using data versus knowledge that's a research problem that we have not completely um, you know solved i think you know i i'm i find both the arguments are you know reasonably compelling that there may well be other interesting ways where continuous representations might have modularity properties but we do want to get there i don't want to be forced to give my knowledge in as bazillion examples just because that's all the machine knows how to use so we need to be able to use both of them data and doctrine and that's what i would like to say okay almost to the to the second so we promised a 4:30 adjourn time thank you for being here i hope this whetted your appetite on this important topic please join me in thanking our panelists <laughs>